Remember the Titans. Push them, pull them, do something. Attitude, reflect leadership, Captain. This is truly one of the most quoted movies in the Sweeney household. <clears throat> and why not? It's about football, right? 41 days and counting to college football kickoff. If you need to know, you can just ask my son Jack. I, I promise you, he will be within the second at least. Welcome to Table of Grace. My name is Kathy Sweeney. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Christ United Methodist Church. Chad is uh, still away on a break, coming back today, I think. But he will join you again next week. But I'm especially thankful to be able to share with you today. And for those who are joining on live stream, uh, thank you for having me. Like I said, it's one of the most quoted movies in the Sweeney household. It's about football, right? Well, yes and no. So let me set the stage for those of you who have not seen this movie before. Just give me a minute or two. 1971, Alexandria, Virginia. Trivia, I was born in Alexandria, Virginia. And you know, I, you know I was, I'm from Virginia because I say Virginia and not Virginia. <clears throat> Busing as a legal way to integrate schools had just been addressed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Integrations in the school within it had been addressed off and on since 1965. And if, even if you've seen the movie, you may not know this, that at that time in 1971, or before 1965, there were three high schools in, in Alexandria. One of them a white school, one of them a school strictly for African Americans, and one, T.C. Williams, which opened that year, was integrated from the start. So why is 1971 such a big deal? Well, when the other two schools closed, they combined into T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria. So there became one high school in Alexandria, which was perceived as a problem for some people. Remember the Titans is a movie about that first year of only one high school with only one football team led by a newly assigned black coach who was hired in over a long time and very successful white coach. Remember the Titans, the movie, and T.C. Williams, the first integrated football team, tells a story of unity, a film that reimburses, reim, reim, reinforces that we're all children of God, no matter what our skin color, our gender, our economics, our status, every one of us is a child of God, each deserving the same respect and love that Jesus commanded for us. And when I think of Christian unity, I think Paul says it just about as well as anyone. He addresses it in many of his letters, but what I've, sh I've chosen for us today is from Galatians in the third chapter. Let me read it for you. As many of you are aware, as we're baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You ever wonder what it must, must have been like for Paul, all this traveling? You know, you might be going to vacation, and when you come home, you have a, a need a vacation from your vacation because you're so tired. I can't even imagine what Paul was like. Let me, let me tell you about it for a minute. Christ was crucified and resurrected, it's believed, around 33 AD. And Paul, you might remember, used to, was Saul of Tarsus, the one who persecuted and round up the early Christians, taken back to jail in uh, Jerusalem. And Saul was visited by Jesus Christ in a blinding vision about 10 years after Christ's death. And after he was converted to Christianity and took on the name of Paul, he began planting these churches all through Asia Minor within a few years of that conversion. So we're talking now about 12, 13 years after Christ was crucified and resurrected. And some of those churches were in Galatia. And if you're trying to geographically place where that might be, think current-day Turkey. That's, that's where we're talking about. 
But here's a problem that he might not have expected and others might not have expected when those churches were planted. Paul wasn't there a long time with any one particular church, and he had a lot of ge geography to cover in order to plant more churches. And Paul was now having to integrate two Christians, two different groups of Christians, the Jews and the Gentiles. And this one question kept coming up over and over and over. Should these new Gentile Christians be subjected to the Mosaic law? In this case, the biggest question was, should they be circumcised? And it wasn't just here, it was everywhere in the early church. Do these new Gentiles need to obey the Mosaic law as all of the Jews who are now Christians have done? And the most visible and personally identifying of those laws was circumcision. It's in this context that Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians. And the answers to the questions that he gave is that we affirm that we are all one in Christ and that our faith in Christ is what unifies us, not anything else, nothing according to our outward appearances. And in fact, in chapter 2, he specifically wrote that God does not judge by external appearances. In that context, he was talking about status and the appearance of wealth and power. But I think we can all say that it covers all appearances that we're talking about, color of skin and even circumcision. All of this question about cir circumcision would be officially settled a few years later as the Jerusalem Council met and put an end to this, but for now, Paul is answering the question for these churches in Galatia, and the letter was being sent around, and he stresses unity. He stresses it here and will continue to stress that throughout all of his letters that are contained in the New Testament. We are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, male or female is even washed away. We must integrate and join together if we are going to be the true body of Christ. My friend, Reverend Richie Butler, who's the senior pastor of St. Paul United Methodist Church in downtown Dallas. It was the first, first Methodist church in downtown Dallas. Leads a program called Project Unity. It's a program that's grown out of the 2016 Dallas police shootings where five officers were killed and seven others were injure, injured by a lone sniper. You may have been here or you may have heard about it. It was very... Um, it was a traumatic and tragic uh, event in the Dallas area. It hit home for a lot of us. And Richie answered that angst with a series of events that start with the phrase, together we. You may have heard of some of them. Together we dine. Together we read. And one of my personal favorites, together we ball, where pastors and policemen and other first responders gather together with congressmen and women on the basketball court. As Richie reminds us often, sports can bring us together like a lot of other things can't. But so can prayer. And every Friday at 9 a.m., Reverend Richie Butler, Reverend Dr. Andy Stoker, who's the senior pastor of First United Methodist Church in downtown Dallas, and I lead a prayer call called Together We Pray. It lasts about 15 minutes, and it combines prayers with devotionals, all centered around this concept of unity and working together and working amongst our differences. And if you want to hear more about that, call me or email me. I'll talk to you about it. Anyone's invited to be on that call and listen in. But it was Friday's call a few days ago when Reverend Ritchie talked to us about an interesting concept called, that he called paradigm shifts. And specifically that our community and our nation needs a strong para paradigm shift to get back on track to which Christ has called us. And he used this great analogy. He said that we need to move from tribalism I'm going to get mine in that clip that we just saw, from tribalism to team. 
Think about what tribalism rewards. Tribalism rewards the me versus us mentality, the us versus them mentality, the mentality that for someone to win, someone has to lose. And Richie called for a paradigm shift that moves us more into a team-led vision, one that brings us all together towards a common goal, in our case, Christ, respect and love for each other. Richie didn't know I was doing this uh, sermon based on this movie as an illustration, but his devotion led straight to the heart of this movie. T.C. Williams, the school, the team, the town of Alexandria needed a paradigm shift. They saw, we saw it in the first clip that, that divided the two leaders of the football team, and that was the case throughout the rest of the team and even the coaching staff. But over time, and with some strong discipline and leadership from the head coach, the team made a shift. And they came together, black and white, at a two-week preseason camp in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They had to fight through the antagonism and even vitriol back home. They had to go through that shift again when the people around them, including their parents, shunned their new friendships with each other and this brotherhood. So they had to shift and shift again. But look what happens when they brought the town along for the ride and the town started shifting. Look what happens. What do you think Paul would write about these paradigm shifts? Better yet, what do you think Jesus would say about them? I think you already know because he already said it. In the 13th chapter of John, we read the words of Jesus. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so should you love one another. And how did Christ show us that? By eating with tax collectors and healing on the Sabbath, breaking some of the rules. What did he teach us? He taught us to love our enemies, not just our neighbors. His words and deeds remind us that the healthy aren't the ones that need the doctor, it's the sick. He called and called to and he shared with the sinners, not just with the righteous. He shared conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, and he shared meals with the poor. All of these things were done out of love. That was a shift in itself for what good can come from eating with the poor, right? What's the use? What am I going to get out of that? This was a shift. And in a culture where women were part of the excluded class, he healed a woman who only needed to grab on to the thread of his robe with her faith. Jesus showed us how to love and to love everyone, no matter what our differences are. Jesus himself was a paradigm shift. God came here to this place to change how we treat each other, to look at it differently and to share how we can't exactly be in a right relationship with God if we're not treating each others as brothers and sisters. It's that simple. The paradigm shift that we needed was Jesus. Look what happened in the town of Alexandria in that, that short clip when the shift started in the town. Black and white together on a team winning games, I'm sure that had something to do with it, and showing others that there's nothing to be afraid of when we address our fears head on through Jesus. Even his mother approved of Jerry's new friendship, but we saw in that clip that she's now inviting Julius and seeing his massive arms surrounding her and showing love as they share a meal over dinner. And throughout the year, this brotherly love between two teammates who started out totally opposite to each other. A friendship developed, and then tragedy struck. On the night of the team's biggest win, team captain Jerry Boutier was in a paralyzing car wreck. And here's where you see the true transformation of this relationship between Julius and Jerry. Let's look at this clip.
Nurse, are you blind? Can't you see the family resemblance? That's my brother. I was afraid of you, Julius, and now I know I was only hating my brother. This relationship has been transformed in the movie, and Paul's letter reminds us that there is no black and white, no slave or free, no Jew or Greek. And we shouldn't let the fact that we know that now frighten us because we're all one in Christ, the Christ who came and died for us so that we could look fear right in the eyes and turn the other way, turn toward loving one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, bringing the world together no matter our race, our creed, our gender, our status, love one another. Now, there's a lot going on today. And I have one more short story to share with you because it reminds all of us that we're human. And as much as we know this, as many times as we read these stories, as many times as we read these letters and hear the lessons of Christ and the stories and the parables and what he did for us, we're still human. And we're still be, going to be fighting some of this all the time, and even when we think we're doing good. Let me share this story. The story about how we have a tendency to work, revert back to where we're comfortable, or even, even some things that happened 30 years ago. Sometimes, even when we think we're loving, we still haven't completed that paradigm shift. And that's why it's so important that we continue with these lessons. Let me explain. At our house, we call this the Taco Cabana story. Some of you may have heard me tell it before, but our son Jack, who's now 17, going to be a senior at Pierce, when he was younger, he played select baseball. And he was a team in McKinney, and driving from Richardson to McKinney, you can imagine, practice starts at 6. It was a little challenging. Three days a week for practices and games, but it did give he and I a chance to have a lot of conversations and discussions about all kinds of stuff. I was still a student at Perkins School of Theology at the time, and I used much of the time for Jack's, at Jack's practices reading my lessons and doing whatever, but we'd have some great discussions. And for a long time one season, on the drive back from McKinney, all the way up at 380, we'd drive back down 75 after practice, and at night, we would stop at Taco, Taco Cabana, the one there at Stacy Road, right by Prime um, Outlet Malls. Um, Jack wouldn't even have to tell me when we pulled in. I'd order him two brisket burritos every time. And this one night, we pulled in as usual. It was dark, about 9 p.m. or so, and daylight savings time hadn't kicked in yet. And there's not a whole lot of activity at that outlet mall at night, if you hadn't noticed before. So it's pretty vacant. And on this night when we pulled in, there was a car near the drive-thru. The hood was up, and the driver clearly was having some kind of trouble. I didn't see him right away, but he poked his head up eventually, and I saw he was a young man, maybe early 20s, maybe mid-20s, African-American, and he looked pretty frustrated. So I pulled into the drive-thru, ordered Jack's meal, ordered myself a tea, and then when we finished through the drive-thru, I pulled around again, noticing that he was still there and nothing had moved. And I thought, I'm going to pull in the parking spot and see if he can be helped. I asked Jack if that was okay. He agreed. And I got out, got out and asked what the problem was. Could I give him a jump? And he looked pretty relieved because nobody had helped him yet. Thankfully, I have jump cripples in my car because I was properly trained by my dad when I learned how to drive. He and I got the car jumped. And he turned the car around and started to, to leave. And I told him, I'll follow you as far as Richardson to make sure that the car doesn't, doesn't um, stop again, that, it, that it's still running. So I got in my car, and to be honest, I was feeling pretty good about myself, about this, helped, helped my neighbor today. That's a little vulnerability there. And then his car jerked and stopped again before we even got out of the parking lot. So I got back out of the car, and Jack and I helped push him into a parking space. And let me tell you, this, this guy, I really wish I remember his name, but he looked ready to cry. And he was telling me that he had been working at a retirement community in Sherman for about three weeks. 
He was coming down to Dallas where his girlfriend and three-year-old son were, had just moved about a month before. He hadn't seen his little boy in three weeks, and that's all he wanted to do. All he wanted to do was to see them, and they live near downtown Dallas. Now, as any of you probably were the same, my heart went out to him, and I shared that I could get him to the dart station in Richardson, and maybe he could take the dart down there, and his girlfriend could come pick him up. That sounded reasonable to me, right? Turned around to Jack. You okay with that, Jack? Sure, Mom. He nodded. So the man gathered up his things. There wasn't much, and we drove back through to buy him a Coke. And on the way back, as we were driving down, I called Steve, my husband, to let him know that we were helping someone out with car trouble. That's all I told him. I don't know why I didn't tell him more. So we talked a bit, I learned a little bit about him, that he was working to get funds together for the family to live together permanently here in Dallas. And he talked with Jack about baseball and basketball, the great uniter sports, right? And then I learned his girlfriend was having another baby in about a month. And I suggested he call her to let her know what was going on so that she could pick him up at the dart station near where they were. But when he did that, it got quiet in the car and I could hear on the other side of the phone. It was pretty obvious that neither of them knew where the dart station was and they were mixing it up with dart and greyhound. You know how you can hear that conversation on the other side of the phone that's going on? And she sounded really tired. So I knew that coordination might be quickie, quick, might be a little difficult. So I told him to take, I told him to turn off the phone, tell her I'll, I'll take you all the way. Where is it? And he said he lived off of Knox Henderson. And I turned around to Jack again and I said, you okay, Jack? And he said, sure, Mom. So we drove right by the Richardson exit, all the way down, and we approached Knox Henderson. And I knew where we were going to go. See, Knox Henderson and 75 is this intersection where if you turn right, you're headed to the trendy Highland Park area. I actually lived there my first couple of years uh, when I was working downtown. But if you turn left, and this is uh, a few years ago before the redevelopment, you turn left, you're heading into some more poverty-stricken areas that you might question whether you should go. Turn left here, he said when we got there. So my instincts were right. But don't worry, you're doing a good, good thing for this man and his family, I told myself. It'll be fine. And after that, it was just a few turns before we got to his place. We dropped him off. He thanked us profusely. We got back on 75, and we headed up north. It was as simple as that. We had done our good deed for the day, right? And I was feeling pretty good about myself. Maybe this is what seminary is about, that we just recognize these things. And I was noticeably quiet on the way, even feeling good about myself, like I said. And surely, uh, this is what we should do as Christians. And then Jack piped up. Hey, Mom? Yeah? What are you going to tell Dad? He surely had picked up that all I had said was that we're helping someone with car trouble. And I told him, I don't really know, Jack. And he said, why is that? I said, well, Jack, I suppose I don't want to get questioned about whether it was the right thing to do. I mean, if you were to tell someone, if I were to tell some of my friends or other people that I had taken a stranger, a young black man, into the car, taken him with car trouble down to the, the Ross Avenue area of town with my 11-year-old son in the back seat, I might get questioned for judgment on that. <clears throat> it certainly questioned my wisdom. Maybe I should have questioned it, too. I had talked to myself. And then it was quiet for another second, and Jack said, Hey, Mom? Yeah? What's his being black have to do with it? Eleven years old. Nothing, honey. And I drove the rest of the way in silence. See, it's even when we know we're doing the right thing that we still have so far to go in our paradigm shift. I don't beat myself up for it. It is a great story to remind myself that we are doing this and we do things and build relationships with each other 
because our heart tells us to do that. It's clear that Christ calls us to love one another, that Christ himself was the paradigm shift that was needed then and still needed today. Christ calls us to love one another, not to tolerate each other, or to do nice things for people because we should. Christ calls to change our hearts to free ourselves up from the fear of these differences and to do so in loving ways that bring about change for all of us and bring us closer together in unity. The paradigm shifts are not about what we should do. They're about changing hearts, looking past the differences and looking through the heart and soul of a man, not just at the look of that person. Should I have called a cab that night for that young man? Maybe gave him a money to buy a bus ticket? Maybe. But not because he's black. Neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free. We are one in the body of Christ. Believe it and practice it over and over as Christ showed us because that's the shift we need to completely transform our lives and the lives of others. Amen? Let's pray. Holy and loving God, you are the paradigm shift we need. We look to you for all of the guidance, for all of the wisdom, to show us how to love one another. God, we know that we are not perfect, and we never will be. But you have shown us the way, the way to be together in perfect unity, to truly love our brothers and sisters, no matter the differences. So help us, God. Send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts that we might be receiving, we might even seek out those who are different to bring us all together in perfect Christian love and unity. Show us how, God, every day. Amen.